Now, our society is fascinated with learning about relationships and relationship dynamics, what makes them work, what makes them fail. And we see this clearly in a lot of different ways. One of the ways we know that is because the show Married at First Sight not only got a single season on TV, but is currently in its 14th season. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Married at First Sight is a show where relationship experts get together and they travel to a particular city in the United States and they interview different local singles uh, who are interested to sign up to marry a complete stranger without ever having known them before, and it's a legal marriage. And so uh, through this application process and this interview process, they, they try to match up between three and five perfect couples with their perfect match. Uh, and and they, they match them up based off of their, their similar mutual values and goals and lifestyles. Uh, and they arrange for them to get married to each other sight unseen. And then after eight weeks of marriage, they, they sit each couple down individually and they, uh, they determine whether or not those couples would like to decide to stay married or whether they'd like to get a divorce. Now, the interesting thing about the show, other than its shockingly low success rate, is how the relationship experts help the couples in times of conflict. Because at least once every season, there's always one couple that's on the verge of complete destruction, and they reach out to the experts for help. But what the experts don't do is just come in, snap their fingers, make everything better. Hey, you do that, you stop doing that, and then bam, it's all fixed. That's not what they do. Instead, the experts give the couples something for them to do so that they can be part of the solution, so that they can fix their own marriage. So they'll say things like, uh, like your role as a husband is to make your wife feel wanted and cared about. And when you become emotionally unavailable because you're distancing yourself, you're, you're pointing out things that are wrong in this relationship based off of what you've experienced in previous relationships, when you do those things, she detaches herself too and she doesn't feel like she's wanted or cared for. So maybe instead of pulling away from your spouse with bringing up constantly all the things that are wrong about the relationship, uh, what I want you to do is try making time each day to talk to your spouse about things that encourage and excite you about it. Things like that, that's, that's the kind of help that the experts give. And I bring this up because I think a lot of us approach prayer the same way the couples approach the help from the experts. See, whether we're new to prayer, whether it's something we've done our whole lives or, or anywhere in between, the tendency seems to be to think that prayer is just asking God for help, just asking him to do something. And while that's certainly part of it, that is an aspect of prayer that, that God invites us to do. He wants us to come to him and ask for things. That's not all that prayer is. Prayer is much more than that. So today we're continuing in our series on the Lord's Prayer, where we're taking a look at this prayer given to us by Christ himself as a, a simple way to, to communicate with God. And we're, we're taking a look at how this prayer and understanding this prayer can inform and transform how we live and move and work in this world. And this week specifically, I want us to take a look at how God might be inviting us to do something, inviting us into a particular purpose when we pray for his kingdom come and his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if you've been coming to St. Mark for a while or are really experienced in the church at all, chances are you've prayed this line before. You've prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But have we stopped to think about what, is it, what it means like what, what does it mean? What exactly are we praying for when we ask for God's kingdom to come down and meet us in our place now and for his will to be done? Because I think for many of us, if we haven't thought about it yet, praying for these things to happen means, means praying for, for Christ's return. When he physically comes up out of his throne of heaven and comes back down to earth to fix things. Right? He's going he's gonna to put an end to wickedness and pain for all time and eternity. Death is going to be destroyed. Sin is going to be no more. Everything's going to be great. And Jesus is going to gather all those together who call upon him for salvation into a new heavens and a new earth. And he's going to rule over all of us in perfect love and perfect peace. And God's perfect will, his desire for all of us to love and to serve him and to love and serve each other is going to be done. And God's kingdom, which is marked by grace, mercy, love, forgiveness, all those good things, will have no end. Now that sounds pretty good, right? Give us that, that's what we want. We don't have to worry about a potential world war around us, right around the corner. We don't have to worry about gas prices or being on edge about supply chain shortages or even worse, no stock of toilet paper. 
everything is going to be perfect. But the thing is, regardless of if we pray for that to happen or not, whether or not we pray for Christ to come back again, he's going to come again. And his return means he's going to bring, bring God's kingdom and will to earth. It's going to happen regardless. And that's, that's a great thing. But, but why would we pray for that if it's something God already promises he's going to do? Why would we pray for something? What is the purpose of asking God to do something that we already know he's going to do? Because there's more to praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done, than simply praying for Christ to come again. Again, that's something we should be praying for, but that's not simply all there is to praying this prayer. Like, what do we do in the meantime? What do we do between now and when Christ comes again? How, how can we get his kingdom here now and his will done now? Like, are we just supposed to sit back and pray and, and wait? Like, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. Amen. And then just sit back and wait. Man, I wish you'd hurry up soon. Man, those truckers are blocking everything, aren't they? No, that's not what we're supposed to do. See, anytime we pray for God to take away the aches and the pains we feel in our broken bodies, anytime we ask God to take the cancer away that's ushering another one of our loved ones closer and closer to death's door, anytime we sit on our phone and doomsday scroll for hours and ask for God to end the injustices, the brokenness, the wickedness, the darkness that's rampant in our world, and anytime we pray for God, just, God, you know how much I care about my friend who, who doesn't know you, and I know how much you care about them, so much so that you invite them into a relationship with you through what your son did. And I, my heart breaks at the thought of them not knowing you, of them spending an eternity apart from you. So won't you move? Won't you work? Won't you open their eyes to see your love, your mercy, your goodness, your kindness, how awesome you are? Please, God, work in their heart and in their life. Anytime we pray for things like that, Anytime we pray for God to meet us in the brokenness and the messiness in our world now, we're praying for God's kingdom to come now. And we're praying for his will to be done now. And we want him to answer those prayers now. But with all that's going on in the world, sometimes it seems like God's ignoring us or that he's just... He's just sitting there holding off on, on doing anything until he gives Jesus the go-ahead to mount up on that cloud and head this way. See, sometimes it feels like we're being ignored by the very one who invited us into a personal relationship with him. That we're being shunned by the very person who, who provided us with this example of what to pray for, that he's not doing it. We've done our part, we've asked, we've begged, we've prayed. Why isn't God doing his part? Why isn't he answering me? See, for honest, sometimes we feel that way. And we forget that God has already answered our prayers. He already answered that. 2,000 years ago, God himself came down in the form of a man to earth. And he taught all about the will of God and what God's kingdom is like. And he healed diseases and he brought the peace and comfort of God to people who were hurting and he even raised people up from the dead. And then he let himself die so that we, the sinners he died for, can have a relationship with God again. And then he was raised up again to new life, so that we too, who call upon him for salvation, may have that same life. And before he ascended back into heaven, he gave his followers something. He gave them his Holy Spirit, so that they might have faith in him now. And in doing so, by sending them his spirit, by coming to earth himself to do so, Christ establishes his church. He sets up his kingdom, builds God's kingdom here on earth, even now through the church, through the Holy Spirit working in the lives and hearts of people. The answer to God's kingdom on earth was to send his son and to leave his spirit with us. And his work didn't end 2,000 years ago. The church is still around today. The Holy Spirit's still active and moving. God continues to do his part. He continues to answer this prayer even now, even where we're sitting today. See, God brings his kingdom to you here on earth today by giving you his Holy Spirit through what we do here, through the mutual consolation of people in the church. He brings his spirit to you now and builds faith in Jesus Christ 
so that when you're in pain and you're grieving, you may experience the comfort and the peace of God which, trans- which surpasses all understanding. And he sends you his spirit to strengthen you in times of need so that you too may be a source of strength for others who are in need. And God sent you his Holy Spirit to equip you to love God even when you don't understand what's going on, even when it seems like he's not there. And he sends his spirit to equip you to love and serve other people even when they don't seem very lovable, even when it's hard to love them. So yes, God has answered your prayers through Jesus Christ. And yes, he answers you by giving you the Holy Spirit, but it's still not done yet. God is still doing his part and he's calling you into that work also. He also gives you something to do too. See, God gives his kingdom to you, but not just for your own benefit. He gives his kingdom to you through his Holy Spirit so that God's kingdom may come through you to other people. See, God isn't the only person with a part to play in answering this prayer. We don't just ask him this and then just sit back and wait for him to fix it. We have a role to play too. He has equipped you with his spirit and he sends you out to be the answer to your prayers, to be the very thing you're asking for in someone else's life. And that's really challenging for us to hear, if we're honest, because we'd rather let someone else do it. After all, our schedules are busy enough as it is between our work and our families and our other to-do list that's mounting. It's just easier to to let someone else step in and make the extra effort. It's easier just to call on God and, and wait for him to work. But he wants you to be part of that experience also. By giving you his Holy Spirit, God has chosen you to do that job. He has equipped you to do it with certain gifts, with certain relationships, with his very spirit. He has invited you not just into a personal relationship with him through prayer, but into the very work he's doing in answering those prayers. So do you want God's healing in that broken relationship you have with your child? Well, maybe the healing starts with you in modeling God's restorative and redemptive love for the world to that person, to your child, by continuing to seek them out, even as Christ continues to seek you out when you go far off, when you rebel against him. Do you want the comforting peace and presence of God to be with your friend who's struggling to figure out how how to continue to pay for insurance because their spouse just passed away suddenly that they just got married to and all of the money that they have in savings was pooled together to build a house that they're not going to be able to live in anymore? That they're not going to be able to afford to, to finish that build? Do you want God's peace and presence for that person? Well, Maybe you're supposed to look for ways to be the presence of God to them to bring his comfort to them by reaching out, by sitting with them, by taking a couple hours maybe out of your day to sit and call them on the phone and maybe even sit with silence as you pray for them, as you cry with them, as you're there with them in that messiness and hurt. See, when we're asking for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done, when we're asking for his lordship, his authority, his purposes to come to us, we're doing more than just asking for Christ to come on the last day. We're asking for him to come to us every day as we wait. But we don't just wait. We watch. We watch to see how he's bringing his kingdom and will to us even now. And we, we watch for ways that he might be calling on us to bring those same things to other people. But sometimes, or because sometimes, that's how God wants to answer our prayers. It's not just a simple fix, but he wants to invite you into his process, not just into a relationship, but into his process for answering prayers so that you can be the very answer you're seeking. God wants to use you. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, this is what we're actually praying. We're praying, our Father who reigns victorious from heaven and from that kingdom, please bring your victory and your holy and perfect way of doing things to us in our broken world. Send your son back to us to fix all the things we've messed up, all the things that are dark and broken about this world. And we ask that you would have him hurry back. But until that time, 
Show us how to live in such a way that our lives bring about your gracious will, your will of salvation and your service. Open our eyes to see how we can bring all that is wonderful about your kingdom to the people around us, the people you've blessed us with in our lives. That's what we're praying. See, God doesn't just bring his kingdom and will to us. He brings them through us. So how might God be asking you to be an answer to your prayer today? Or tomorrow? Or every day until Christ comes again as the ultimate answer and all of our work here is finished? What might he be asking you to do? How might you be the answer? Let's go to him now and ask, praying the words that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.